because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Excited today to have Mike Longombardi here. Uh, coach has been a longtime assistant coach in the NBA and been a part of two championship teams with the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2016, Boston Celtics in 2008, and just a tremendous career in basketball. And uh, coach, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you having me on. Well, you know, so many places we can go. I know so many people will be excited to do a deep dive on defense and uh, let's get right into it. And uh, coach, how specific do we get in scout? For example, if player A sets the ball screen, we do this. And if player B uses the ball screen, we do this and it trumps everything. Is that how specific we get or is that more of a playoff situation? But can you talk about the specificity relative to scouting report? I think you're right on, you're hitting it right on the head, especially at the highest level in the NBA. We try to get as specific as, pos- as possible, especially when you're dealing with, with one main person per se. Now, in the playoffs, you can get, take it to a total another level. During the regular season, it might be just one or two guys that you may be able to get away with game by game. Because I know a lot of teams, and I think the more successful teams, are pretty concrete of being, you know, stick to what they do that's made them successful over a period of time. So when we talk about in-game adjustments, how often do you make an in-game adjustment? And then maybe what's the process for that? For example, we're talking about specificity. We're talking about, let's say, ball screen coverage. Like something's happening in the game. What's the cue for you to be able to change and adjust? I think, number one, just you never overreact. Let's look at like their shot spectrum and where they're getting their shots from. Everybody knows now the long two is like a lost start. And sometimes, you know, coaches will say, well, we're going to have to live with that. Now, if they come down and make two in a row, maybe you start to think a little bit more about making an adjustment. Um, but if the things with the adjustments usually come when they're starting to get everything, they're getting the rim, they're getting paint, they're getting free throws. And, you know, then we probably are. Our process is, you know, do it harder, do it better, right? Are we doing it as hard as we possibly can so it'll be better? Uh, if, that's not, if that's not the case, if it is the case, excuse me, and we are trying as hard as we possibly can, then we're going to have to change uh, coverages, uh, excuse me, change players. So we might have to make an adjustment and, and change the matchup. And then after that, if that's not working, then we're going to have to go to a totally different coverage. And usually, like in the NBA, I think, you know, some guy may get one or two and that's okay. But when they start getting three and four, then teams tend to make that adjustment. Well, it's great advice, especially about not overreacting. And, you know, it's not, it's not like necessarily the solution is the adjustment either. And that's got to be really a difficult, challenging part for anyone that has a defensive mindset at the NBA level, because to be honest, players are just going to score. They're that good that you could be perfect on defense and they can still make a play. Is that an important part of this as well? Just a defensive mindset and a determination, perseverance when things, you know, you just get scored on. Absolutely. Like we talk about it all the time. Like, you know, you can play great defense and make a pull up two, or they may even make a three that's highly contested. The game has definitely changed since I first came into the league. It was way more physical way back when, 16 years ago. I mean, teams were really playing with two bigs, and the stretch four, per se, was – it happened, but it wasn't as obvious as it is in today's game, where teams are starting out, like, small. And then, like, to me, the big thing is, is I always say this all the time, like, lineups are a big key from the analytic perspective. We all know about the shot spectrums. I think that's that's the case, but you could watch any game, but in particular an NBA game, and you could break your lineup and it'll take a minute, maybe two minutes, and then the game could be over. You know, it's those type of segments that you have to try to prevent. And sometimes you can't because of foul trouble or injury, things along those lines there. Well, of course. I mean, the ideal situations don't always exist. And, you know, that's true of all teams. So that mindset's so important. And, uh, 
another maybe part that goes with this is that how often do you practice critical defensive moments in a game? Because I think generally we think about offense as special situations, but clearly there's tons of special situations on defense. So can you give some insights to that? Well, I know once we start the season in our training camp and, and the training camp is, is like probably the most important part of a season, in my opinion, because that's where you get to lay your foundation down. And during that time, from that first practice to your first game, which now has gotten shorter and shorter, it used to be like a good month, month and, and maybe six weeks. Now it's getting condensed to like possibly three weeks. But during that time, you have to lay your foundation down and cover those situations. Like I am a big believer in fouling when you're up by three. Uh, you know, we have our rule eight seconds or less. Um, you know, with the timeout for the other team, we'll foul. Now, it can get – it's something you have to practice because if you don't practice and you do it on the fly, then, to me, you're going to put yourself in a, in, a, in a tough situation. We always talk about offensive player catches the ball with their back to the basket, automatic wrap-up. So they are not in a shooting motion, and we won't put ourselves in jeopardy to give them three shots. The other one we talk about when we're going over that specific situation is when the ball's in the air and it's been released, you could run through your defender and that's not considered a, an intentional or technical foul uh, in the last two minutes or off the ball foul before the ball gets in play. So those, that situation in particular, we always work on. And then the big thing in my experience is every day, whatever it was, like we would plan for our blitz package. If we, we might not have used the blitz every game, but we might not have used the blitz for maybe two or three weeks, but we always wanted to review it because we knew when we got to the playoffs, we were going to have to use it. So we would do it like, you know, walk through speed, not like a hundred percent, but not, you know, 0%. We get like in that 50 to 60 range where we cover all the passes out, out of uh, the blitz. If they hit the big, and then he caught it. He made a pass to the weak side wing. This is what we did. If he caught it, skipped it to the corner, this is what we did. And we did that day in, day out. Whenever we did have practice, even though we might not have used it for maybe like a two or three-week span, but we knew we were going to use it in the playoffs. A question that goes with that then, were you constantly telling your players, hey, listen, we might not use this, but be prepared when we do? Is that the mindset? Or Perhaps. are you saying we're going to save this? No, absolutely. First of all, we always just said we want to be tight with it because we know we're going to use it. And then sometimes like, you know, we went to it in the game. Like we may not have started that way, but we went to it in the game. So that kind of helped us going forward. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And certainly that's been that's been a part of your success and some really significant series. It sounds like that that ability to be able to adjust. And is that is that the blend nowadays? Do we need to have an aggressive package to go with these soft packages? I think this is what I'll say. These players are so talented, like you mentioned. And, you know, just being in the fray with the Steph Currys of the world, the Clay Thompsons, the Kevin Durant, I just think it's foolish if you think you're going to do the same thing over a course of the seven game series. Like, that's just, there's no way that that's going to work come playoff time. They have to see different looks. You have to be ready to adjust. And that's just my belief and just what I've experienced. It makes sense in terms of that too. So coach, maybe shifting gears just a just a tad because you mentioned training camp. Player development. How do you incorporate defense into skill and player development workouts? How's that happening now uh, within your philosophy? Well, that's the one thing I wish, you know, we would spend more time with. You know, I think player development number one is about attention. Like our players, they need attention. And once we give them that attention, you know, then I feel like the relationship will grow and the bond will be, be formed. Um, but I think with defense, like a lot of our player development defense stuff is more five on five. Uh, like we really take time to, whether it's before or after practice, in particular, the ones that are, that are struggling with certain rotations, certain coverages, certain techniques, like then we'll definitely address it during that time. But as far as the one on O, you know, two on O, 
you know, those things, I'd like to see more combination where maybe you start your, your skill development session with a closeout, slide your feet, and then make it a combo where they set a pin down and you come off and you attack the paint and finish. You know, those kind of things are creative uh, that I think you're starting to see more and more, but like, I'd like to see it even, even more so. Well, in the challenge is obviously this workload management concept, right? Like you're, that you're less likely to play one-on-one or different types of competitive situations where as college and high school coaches, we would be more likely to play those situations that would help develop some more of this individual technique. So is it more film? Is it more, as you just said, one on oh, is it more conceptual? Is that the answer then moving forward? I think you always have to take that stuff into consideration. Everything changes in an NBA season, how you start to how you finish. And pacing your team with your workload management is critical. I mean, Toronto was a, a great example with how they managed Kawhi's body this year. I mean, he didn't play in every game because he was coming off a, a season-ending injury the previous season. So that's where you have to read the situation. You know, you have to read your team. You have to have everybody on the same page from the coaches to the front office, to your performance team, and just figure out what's best for your team and then just just apply it. You know, I think that's the big thing. As far as like, you know, how much you can, you know, grind or have physical contact per se, I, as the year goes on, like, I just think that's going to be very hard to do at, at the NBA level because you want to make sure they're fresh and you want to try to prevent them from 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 injury but if it's like a college situation or a high school situation where you have you have the ability to practice and not have as many games then i think you need to incorporate that especially playing one on one i don't think teams play enough one on one i remember when i was in boston paul pierce was great the practice was over it would be like king of the hill he'd have the ball all right you get a stop you go on offense you score you stay and to me that's how you learn how to play and learn how to be physical if you're a small guard in a big, getting low, having a wide base, use your chest, use your quick hands to try to deflect the ball away. And then if you're a big guard in a small, maybe you have to give that appropriate cushion to contain the dribble, but be able to contest shot. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's evolved my philosophy away from you first get in the gym, you know, you could do your form shots, you do your stuff and you get ready. And we've evolved it to the point saying, hey, listen, when you first get in the gym, find someone and play one on one. And it has to be organized. Like, I mean, coaches can say, oh, well, the players don't play one-on-one anymore. But, you know, you can organize it in great competitive situations like Paul Pierce did. And that, so that's a great example. Coach, it's, it's the case at all levels. I mean, and sometimes I think we think the NBA is different. But, like, there's a big difference between a veteran and a rookie or a second-year player defensively. Can you talk about that a little bit, about how a player evolves their defensive ability and mindset at the pro level? I think it's definitely there's definitely a difference. There's no question. There's probably more coverages in the NBA level or at the NBA level, excuse me, than in college. Like some teams, for example, like Syracuse, their bread and butter is playing zone. Where when you come to the NBA, you may play zone only on a special situation, whether it's side out of bounds, baseline out of bounds, or in the end at the end of the game, like the the Boston Celtics do. So just knowing those coverages. Because there's so many, like you look at, a, just take the pick and rolls. Like some teams may just be a blitz team. Well, when you get to the NBA, a team may be a, a, a drop team, or they may be a show team, they may be a switch team, where in college, they may only have one coverage. Like in, in college, they may force the ball all to the middle, where in the NBA, they may all want to keep it always on the side or keep it to the offensive player's weaker hand. So those things are definitely different. But I do think experience is a great teacher. I remember when I first started 16 years ago, I mean, I had coached in college for seven years prior, and I kind of knew the game of basketball. But when you get to the NBA, it's like, wow, it's eye-opening. But each year, I can see myself getting more and more comfortable with knowing coaches, knowing what teams are trying to do. And it's the same thing with players. Experience is the best teacher. And just this past year in uh, in Cleveland with Colin Sexton, I know when he started the year, he struggled. But then as the year went on, he played all 82 games. 
And you could see him start to improve and get better and better each game towards the end. Well, and it's such a great example. I mean, two things. One is for, for a guy like Colin Sexton, the games are the practice, right? Because you're, you're not practicing that much outside of it. So there's video and there's film and there's conscientious coaching. But at the end of the day, I mean, his, his actual physical practice is within the game. And that would be different than in college. So learning on the fly and all those different things that go with it. And then, uh, I mean, I, I love the other connection to all this, which is, again, I mean, there has to be intent to improve, right? So is, is that half the battle for, for you as coaches that we have to sell a player on the fact that defense can help their career? It's not just about the team, right? At the NBA level, it's a, it will help their career. Well, I always think it's always about what's, how are you going to showcase your abilities so that you can stay on the floor, right? But like if you're, you know, coaches always, I feel like have a little bit of a leash for the offensive players that are going to score and create and make other players better. Like those guys, their leash may be a little bit longer when it comes to defense. But, you know, if you're a rookie, you know, you got to know how to play. You got And the big thing, I think, defensively is just knowing players and knowing their tendencies. You know, like that's where I think is the biggest adjustment. You know, you got 450 players and actually it's more than that now with the two ways and those type of players, but just knowing guys. And you you could say, yeah, I played against them one time in AAU, but that might've been like four years ago, you know, or he might've been like, that's what's happening now. Like these young players are coming through the like, LeBron James camp. And they're like, yeah, he was at what Chris Paul's camp. Yeah, he was at our camp. But now like, wow, it's like these guys have really evolved and gotten better. So just knowing players' strengths and tendencies, I think, is the biggest battle. And then just the effort and energy and intensity to sustain it and execute it when you get on the court. We, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think maybe it would be great perspective for people. Because, like, in the college game, we always hear about these systems. Like, it's a defensive system. It's pack line. It's this. It's that. Whatever it is. But at the NBA level, is it? there's definitely an overriding philosophy. There's an overriding system. but is it more schematic or is it more based on scouting and personnel? Like what do we base a system on in the NBA? Well, I would say like, if you look at the, the elite defensive teams in the NBA, you got Indiana and Utah. Right. And I would say they're definitely system oriented. Like the fortunate thing for both of them was obviously they have good two way players, but they've been together for a little bit of time. Yes. They've added some players to their roster. I get it. But like for the most part, although this year going forward, excuse me, it's going to be different. But over the past two years, they've kind of had some continuity with their team. So I would say for them, system has been big. For other teams, yes, they have a system as well. But I think what they have to do, like it goes back to my point, is you can't play the same players the same way. Like if you're going into a game and and you're dropping and, and icing with non-shooting fours, and then you're coming into a game and you're playing against Kevin Love, and you're going to drop an ice, well, you know what? He's going to get a lot of wide-open shots that are going to be high-valued looks. So that's where, to me, it goes game by game, uh, uh, personnel-driven. So, But some people are like, hey, we're going to do what we do, and then if he makes, we live with the results, and, and then if not, then we'll make an adjustment, whether it's in the game or the next time they play. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think systems, I think everybody wants to have a system and it's all the makeup of your team. How long have your guys been together? Have you had constant turnover? Like this past year in Cleveland, like we had over 32 different starting lineups. So that was a challenge. It almost felt like we were coaching a, a G League team in the NBA. But the to counter that, like the young players got like unbelievable experiences. Like just playing against great players, like Colin Sexton coming into the game at night, coming into the league at 19 years old, like his week is like one day he's going to have, you know, Kyrie Irving. The next day he's going to have Kyle Lowry. And then uh, the next day after that, it could be John Wall, like three games in a row, you're going against three all-stars and there's no, no substitute for that experience. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's great stuff. And it's great to understand kind of that process at the NBA level that, Again, it's not as simple as you think. And again, so much of that comes back to personnel and talent and all those things. So the, the question that goes with that is, are, are there non-negotiables 
within your system. And you talked about, you know, having a leash for offense. Are players getting sub for defense or is it just certain players getting sub for defense? And do they relate back to this, you know, I say in air quotes, non-negotiables, whatever it's called within a team? Yeah, I just think like every team is different. So I can't speak for every coach in the league, but I'm sure everybody's non-negotiables are like, make sure transition defense we get back. Like that's a number one. We want to limit their easy baskets as much as possible. And, and that's where is it, you know, does the player, is he constantly bickering with the officials or is he just lazy and not getting back? That's where, you know, that's to me like a non-negotiable, Hey, let's get your uh, arrest here. Cause you're not getting back on defense. And then we'll get you back in the game. You know, the other ones I just think is, you know, when you have continuous blown coverages, whether it's on the ball, off the ball, if it's continuous, like to me, that, that those are non-negotiables as well. I mean, listen, sometimes things are going to happen, right? But if it starts to happen over and over again, that's when it becomes troubling. But I just always think of it like this, you know, from a coaching perspective. We always talk about the most important play is the next play. So if you make a mistake on defense, when you come back down on offense, let's make sure we're great. We get a high-quality uh, shot with a high value on it. Let's not turn it over. All right, let's try to get to the free throw line. Then we can set our defense and then you eliminate yourself from putting yourself in those non-negotiable situations on defense. Because sometimes, Chris, like, to be honest, like guys are better. Like you might have a bad matchup and if so-and-so has a bad matchup, we got to help and protect for him. But because we're helping and protecting for him, that means that they might be getting better valued looks. You know, we're putting two on the ball. Now they're moving it around. They're attacking closeouts. They're getting in the paint. Now they're getting all over the place. They're getting everything, right? They're getting the rim. They're getting the threes, and they're getting the free throws. And it's all because we needed to help on a matchup. So, you know, it, some nights are tougher than others. But, from an, you know, as long as they're trying to give an effort, I think that's A number one in the non-negotiable. Coach, I'm so glad you said that because something comes up all the time when I watch NBA basketball with people that don't watch enough NBA basketball. And it's when a layup happens where you give up an uncontested layup with no help rotation. And it's constantly, I hear this thing about, Oh, they're so bad. They don't try on defense, all this stuff. And I'm like, no, no, like that's, that was really the design was look, they're not going to give up this high value three. Now, do they want to give up the layup? No. But sometimes, as you said, over rotating and, you know, panicking and all these compensations that happen will break down the overall philosophy. How do you deal with that? Yeah, like, I, that's, that's a mind-boggling you, thing. You know, you know what? <laughs> no question. Like a couple of years ago when we played Golden State in the playoffs, it was the year after we won and they had gotten Kevin Durant. Like, and that's why I, I try to say this all the time and not as a bailout because I'm, I've been a defensive coordinator. Like your offense has to help your defense, especially when you're playing against elite players. Like if you come down and you miss a layup or you have, take a bad shot, a long two, or if you turn the ball over, when they come back at you like a team of that caliber and you're running back and they have numbers and it's Kevin Durant handling and then you got Clay and Steph both on each side and you're in a three on two situation, you're almost like like <laughs> you're almost running to the shooters and giving the, the layup because those guys are shooting at such a, a high clip. So they definitely or well, great players definitely put fines uh, on you defensively. But that's where I'm just getting back to the point of how hopefully your offense will be your best defense and, you know, make them work on the other end. Like the great players, if you talk to any coach in the NBA, the great players on offense, you got to make them work on the other end and make them play defense, right? If they get a night off and they don't have to guard anybody or their matchup is weaker, then they get to rest and they can conserve all that energy. And then when they got to play on the other end, then they're hard to deal with. But if you can go back at them, and it not necessarily just means attacking their matchup, maybe you screen them a little bit more. Maybe you make them chase off a screen and, and exert some energy so maybe they won't have as much as the game goes on, you know, particularly down the stretch in the fourth quarter. Coach, you've mentioned offense a few times. And look, you're a basketball coach. You could coach either side of the ball. You could coach anywhere. And I think sometimes that's a problem, too, when sometimes people get defined as a defensive guy or an offensive guy. I mean, you're a basketball coach. So let's let's ask this. What have you learned 
on the defensive side, having had that focus for so long, that would give us insight into the things that are the hardest to cover, the things that are the best yeah. practices on offense. Have you given that a lot of thought through your time? No, absolutely, Chris. Like, I just think, you know, I try to, you know, reiterate what you're saying. I'm a basketball coach, right? This is basketball. It's not football. Like, we don't stop every play. It's a free-flowing game. And what you do on one side of the ball can affect the other. Um, but as far as, like, studying great offenses, like, even just going back to, like, when Mike D'Antoni had his Phoenix eight, uh, seven seconds or less, like, just the innovation of playing with space on the floor and having a dynamic point guard with a, a dynamic roller with Nash and Amari Stoudemire, and then you have shooting all over the place. like. That's kind of, you know, that started the trend. But I think of late, the actions that have been very difficult to defend, in my opinion, uh, one is like the pin DHO concept, I call it, where a lot of teams will hit the big at the elbow and then they have a pin down and then followed by a, a dribble handoff. So what I'm trying to say why it's difficult to defend, it's like especially you have the JJ Reddicks of the world flying off, like they're getting that separation with the pin down, right, to cause some kind of, you know, confusion or, or decision making defensively. And then it's cleaned up with a dribble handoff with usually a dynamic roller. So now you have somebody like a JJ coming off, right? You have a dynamic roller. And then the guy that usually set the pin down is created that single side bump. So now you, you, got, you got some stuff you got to deal with. That's not easy. And especially when you have guys who are going at such a high pace. That's the one action I feel like that's been very, very trendy. And, and if you have the right personnel, can be hard to guard. Now, if you have somebody who's a non-shooter who's flying out of the corner, obviously, you just go under everything and then you live with the result. But when a guy like, like him, for example, or even a guy like Kyle Corver, who we had in Cleveland, when they're flying out of that corner, those, those guys are, are, are hard to defend. And then the Spain pick and roll action is becoming very popular where, you know, like, People are getting very creative and in, in however they align into it. But that back pick action on the guy guarding the pick and roll, and then you have shooters spaced out, really, really difficult to defend. And, um, you know, I know I think they were doing that a little while ago, but now it just seems like it's a, it's a real big trend in, uh, in the league. Those are just two examples for you. Well, it's great. And it's great to guide our thinking because, again, when, when we have conversations – with with someone about defense or with offense we've got to be thinking about both and i'm glad you made that connection but i mean the thing off the uh off the, off the pin down for the handoff too is that there's a huge difference between a dribble handoff with it, which involves a screen and a close exchange versus the dribble pitches and i think that's the next yeah. evolution is these dribble pitches are so hard to cover because as you said oh, the no question yeah. you know mike mike d'antoni was doing that a lot with with david lee in new york uh, you know, they, they, they were really, really good at that. And, and he comes down because then how do you, what is it? Is it a handoff or is it a pick and roll? Cause those are the questions I would get as I, as a coordinator, they're like, well, what do we, what do we treat it as? Well, then what we just said, we came to the, the conclusion is we're going to treat that like a, like a dribble handoff. So if it's an under guy, you go under, if it's an over guy, let's go over the top and try to blow that up. Is that the next evolution of defense at the NBA level is really figuring out some different strategies to deal with handoffs? Because it seems like the rise of the handoff, that's, that's coming, right? I mean, there's so many ball screens already, but the handoff seems to be the next level. Well, the one thing about the handoff that, that's good uh, from an offensive standpoint, especially if you're playing teams that are really good at keeping the ball down, like on, on the side, now when the dribble handoff happens, it's kind of tough to do. You know what I'm saying? So. So I think that's a different way to try to get the ball into the middle of the floor. Um, but I think as far as evolution of, of the game right now is I just look at all this switching and, 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 and we call it a switch into a triple switch. So, you know, other people have different terminology. If we switch and they roll the guy into the post, then we kick him out. So that's like a triple switch. Um, I feel like that's been very, very uh, in vogue right now. You know, um, we were doing it. And teams are doing teams have been doing it, but we really did it 
the first year when we beat Golden State in 2016. And we had done it uh, prior to that in the series versus Boston because, you know, Brad Stevens runs a lot of pin DHO, so we were switching. And then when they rolled into the post, we would triple switch and kick them out. And I just think it's the more you watch NBA games, because what's the big thing, right? We want to take away the paint. We want to take away threes. Well, the best way to do that is to switch, because then we have bodies on bodies. We have the ball covered. Now, hopefully you have the personnel to do that so someone can control the ball and knock it blown by off the dribble. And then it, what it does is if you're good at that, it gets them stagnant. And then it plays right into your hands. And then their looks become less valued. And the team that gets uh, the, the better shots are going to win. You know? So if you can take away those better shots, take away having to be in a coverage, which could give them rim, three, or free throw, now just switching kind of stagnates them, you know, you're probably going to win that game. Well, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's interesting because I don't think every team started switching as much as you thought either. Right. Like in the NBA, like we kind of no, thought I, maybe two years ago, everyone was going to switch, but not everyone's switching. Right. And that's personnel. Yeah. That's definitely personnel driven, Chris. And that's why, like, you know, for me and my experiences, like if you looked at us, we, we weren't so good in Cleveland until like the playoffs, you know, now in the playoffs, we got to dial in, you know, we locked in and, and guys were just really focused and yeah, teams still got higher numbers, but, but I know like deep down, like our success until we got to golden state, you know, cause those guys, once they got Kevin Durant, it made it very, very difficult to deal with, you know, but, but yeah, switching is to me, I think, you know, Houston has, has made a, a living out of it. Um, but I just think it can get it get teams stagnant, and it is probably the best way to go if you have the personnel to do it. Now, if not, then you're going to have to, you know, be creative, whether you go into a show coverage, you know, or whether you go into under coverages, whatever it may be. But, but I do think switching is the way to go. Coach, how do we defend the short roll, or is that a place we want the ball now? with this philosophy, do we want the ball that pocket pass to the short roll or is that something that we should, you know, are we, are we gapping and containing and not over panicking to it? What's the philosophy now in a short roll? Well, I think to me, the best way to defend a short roll is, is if you have a guard who's, you know, physical and determined to get back in front, right? So your big can be back. Once they make that short roll pass, then you can recover and then have a high hand to contest. You know, Indiana is one of the better teams in the league. So for all the listeners out there, you know, watch uh, Sabonis and Miles Turner. Those guys are really, really good. Um, they do a great job of obviously being able to do both shoot and, and, uh, and drive, and they can pass a little bit as well. Um, my whole thing is, is, is get that guard to get back in front especially when they slide a guy along the baseline, if they set a high pick and roll, they slide him along the baseline. And then, you know, then you're going to have to go into your package. What do you do? If you can't get back in front, are you going to veer back? And then if they throw it, uh, if that guy goes down into the post, are you going to triple switch him out? Or are you going to just, hey, on the throwback, we're just going to come back and late contest and live with the long two if they're shooting in that short roll kind of area, because most of the time those are right around the free throw line. Are you going to live with that? Because that's a shot we all say analytically that we're ones we're willing to live with. Or are you going to have to maybe pull over and really stunt hard, but then you out of the weak side corner, but then you may be vulnerable to a back cut. But if they back cut, is your next guy ready to help and be vertical or block a shot or take a charge if, if they do hit the cutter from the weak side corner? So there's many different things you can do. Um, obviously, your personnel is going to dictate that. But, but I think the best one is being back a little, maybe, excuse me, not being back so far, being more up, but getting back in front with your guard so your big can get back and be there right on the catch to contest and challenge. Coach, I think what everyone's learning is how easy it is to be a defensive coordinator in the NBA, right? <laughs> Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Yeah. I, just uh, I, I just hope I'm, they're not like, whoa, what is this guy talking about? He's all over the place. But there is a method to our madness. And obviously course. being in the league 16 years and being around great players who pick this stuff up, when you start saying like the big thing for me is your terminology and every coach, I don't care 
from middle school to the NBA, your term- terminology has to be tight. Everybody's got to be speaking the same language so that when we say, okay, when they run this one five high pick and roll where they're going to slide along the baseline, our coverage is going to be up to touch and get back on the pass. All right. Our secondary coverage is going to be, we're going to veer back. You know, our third coverage may be, we're going to go into full rotation. So as soon as we give those commands, everybody's on the same page doing what they need to do. How are you building that communication? Emphasis, video, are there Blackboard sessions to go through each of the words or video sessions to go through the words? Obviously, you're doing on court, but what are some of the things that coaches can take home and say, okay, this can help us build communication? I think the best thing is for coaches to shut up and let their players talk in practice. You know, like, like I learned that early in my career with, with Doc Rivers. He's like, listen, I don't want to hear a coach say a word. Let's hear these guys talking, you know, and, 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 and I think that is very, very helpful. Uh, the other one that I think is really good is when we go into our walkthrough segment, you know, we, we may not go full blown hundred percent, but the one thing we talk about is making sure the talk and the communication communication is early, loud, and, uh, uh, continuous. And it's crystal clear. I love, I love the fact that I learned this from working for Jeff Van Gundy, which I, who I think is one of the best is when he explains or demonstrates there's no confusion. He's going into his one, no more than two word terms. So now everybody knows when we read, that means we are going to front the post. When we are going to uh, black, that means we are going to early blitz the pick and roll. You know, if we are going to blue, that means we are going to double team from the top. Like, so everything had a term, um, excuse me, every action had a, had a term and it was one, no more than two words. So we all knew what we were doing without hesitation. No, uh, that's, that's good. That's great stuff. And I mean, let's do a few things here, but I know we talked a little bit about some different things, but I think something that's not talked about enough is baseline inbound. Do you, do you have some pointers about how coaches can better defend Bob's and then we'll jump to sobs after that, but let's start with baseline inbound. What are some, some key teaching points that coaches should consider? Okay. Number one, like, so this is one thing that I would like to experiment a little more. Maybe it's a little innovative. The teams have done this a little bit. I would say trying zone, you know, uh, going maybe two, three out of zone, uh, baseline out of bounds. Don't guard the inbounder. Everybody's zoned up in your area. How many times I've seen this over and over again where guys just come off a double screen, they get to the ball side, wing, corner area, and they get a wide open shot. Well, if you're playing zone, that might help prevent that from happening. But if you're, if you're not, you know, you don't have the courage to try to do that or you just feel like you weren't able to put that in, you know, especially in the NBA level, um, I think the big things are bodying up. So, and what I mean by bodying up on baseline out of bounds is before the ball is entered, we got to be bodied up so that our offensive player won't get separation to go wherever they want. Let's dictate to them which way we're sending them. Now, if you're a switching team, that's critical. You have to be physical on the body. You got to switch up and you got to switch under to take away options, right? After you're, uh, you're bodied up, if you're just a normal team, then you just have to read personnel. Are you going over screens or are you going under? And, but most of the times what a lot of teams do is they send their best shooter to that ball side corner. And that's where we talk about tracking now. And this is something that we try to emphasize a lot. It's worked well sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, where you have a a count in the back of your head as soon as the referee handles hands the ball in. You're you're protecting the basket for 1001, 1002. So any cuts or any movement to the to the basket, you'll have it protected. But then after the 1002 count, you go 1,003, 1,004, you jump to the corner area, wing area, so that shooter that he comes off, they won't be able to pass it to him. And then you have to know for that last second, 1,005, you come back to protect the basket in case there's a curl or a slip. So those are things that we've tried to emphasize and work on. Um, but I, just from an innovation factor, based on out of bounds, you know, I would like, uh, I'd like to see maybe some teams do some zone. Fascinating. And thank you for those insights. Lots for coaches to think about. And how about sideline out of bounds, which again, we know sideline out of bounds situations happen a little bit more in the FIBA game 
and the NBA game than they do yeah. in college and in and, and high school. But how about some sideline inbound thoughts on defending? I think the same thing. You know, I would say majority, not everyone, but majority. Uh, there's a couple of things that happen sideline. There's really three main things that happen sideline out of bounds. Usually a zipper uh, into a high pick and roll, that's one. Zipper into a uh, wide pin down, that's two. And the third one is a lot of the, the rip slash back screen for the inbounder, okay, followed by, you know, dribble handoff action for the screener who, the, the person who ripped the, the inbounder. So, like, you know, they're looking for switch, then maybe they can post it. Those are the three main things that you see, you know, especially in the NBA game. There's some other stuff. I'm not saying that, 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 that that's the only thing that you'll see. But I would say if you had to take a, a, a general survey of side out of bounds in the NBA, you're going to see those three things. So, and then it's the same thing, right? You go back into, you know, tracking the inbounder, um, and being on the body, but then what's your coverage is in those situations? What are you doing in high pick and roll? Are you dropping? Are you showing? Are you switching? Are you blitzing? So you stay with that. And if you go into the pin down, what are you doing? Are you top locking where you're making, you know, you're determined to not let the great shooter come off. He's going to have to take a different route and go to the other side. Or are you locking and trailing and trying to blow up the action? Or are you shooting the gap? Or are you switching? So that's where you just have to stick to your basic uh, principles. You know? And then on the rip screens, what are you doing on them? Are you forcing high? Are you going too removed? You know, th- that just depends on personnel and what your philosophy is as a coach. How much are we, consider- like, how much are we teaching considering on-the-ball defense? Like, is, it, is it largely we're trying to keep the ball square? Are we forcing directions? Like, obviously, you can only speak to your philosophy, but is that something, I mean, because, again, these are conversations that happen on Twitter every day. People are obsessed with where no you're forcing the ball. So what, what, give us an insight into that. I mean, my philosophy is, is like, listen, at the end of the day, like, just keep the ball in front of you as much as possible, right? Now, if, if guys are so, so strong one direction, like, if they're strong right hand, then let's sit on that right hand and he has to dribble left. Even like to me, even if he goes left and we make him take a tough shot, hey, that's one of those where we're going to live with it. You know, we're going to clap our hands and we're going to get the ball back and we're going to go down on the other end. You know, we're not going to overreact to that. My whole thing is I always want, I always say this to our guys, make guys earn their money, right? These guys are so talented, but don't give them easy ones. Don't let them just get a direct line drive by you, right? Don't fall asleep and get cut back door. Don't bet, bite on a shot fake so then they go to the free throw line. If they're going to score, make them make and, and, you know, those are the moves that are on Sports Center. But to me, they've earned their money. Like, if it's going to be I drive one way, I cut you off, they spin, I cut you off again, shot fake, shot fake, shot fake, and they make a tough shot, then we, then we have to live with that. But the easy ones have to be taken away. So as far as individual defense, your goal is to make them earn their money stay between them and the basket as much as possible and defend without fouling. It's great. I love how you broke that down for us and, uh, you know, makes it, makes it easy to understand. Cause I think again, sometimes there's a, an obsession with the direction rather than the result, obviously in these situations. So, uh, game day or day before practice, uh, or day before a game practice, like it doesn't happen as much in the NBA. So maybe it's more game day in terms of that, but, what does practice look like? Actually, let's start with that. Let's say you do have an off day. What does practice look like? Or is it what we would stereotypically think? You know, there's offense versus defense drills. There's four on four. There's shell. What, what's happening the day before practice when you get a ch- or day before game when you get a chance to practice? So it, it, earlier in the year, it'll definitely be more intense. Later in the year, it may, may be more cleanup. But generally, when these guys get here, in, in the places that I've been is everybody has their like assigned times, right? Usually the younger guys are first, then it goes by seniority. So the younger guys are usually either on the court first, right? Doing their, their, their daily devotionals, I, I call them, or people have used the term vitamin, where they're in there, they're on the court for about 20 minutes, working on their skill development, whatever it may be, right? And, and this is where 
You have to be flexible. It could be one day we're really going to work on our finishing. We've missed way too many layups. We haven't converted in the paint. We got to be great there. Or it could be, hey, we got to be great with our corner threes. We got a lot of high value corner three looks, but we're not making them. So that'll be a point of emphasis. So each day that's different. And then what happens is there's like stations or so-called segments. So you go from the court to the weight room and then weight room, the players that are there may come onto the court. And then after they're done on the court, they may go to the training room. So everybody has like their little system before we actually start practice. Then when practice will start, it could start with film, you know, about 15, 20 minutes, or it could start with a review or an intro. That's usually what the case is. Hey, last game, we did a bad job with our post double teams. Let's walk over. Let's put us back in those situations that we were in that we didn't execute well. Or it could be now let's introduce our post double team package. It just depends, okay, on, on what the coach feels like because we've been in all these types of, of situations before. Then what you really like to do to me is you get a good activation. You know, you, your strength and conditioning coach will get them activated with stretching, right? And then from there, depending on how much their load management allows, right, is it going to be, hey, you got them for 20 minutes, like full contact. So then you're probably going to shoot to get them loose. We like to do a lot of ball handling and passing. Uh, like that was big for us, like just coming down full court, handle the ball, work on your pocket pass, work on your inside pocket pass, work on your hook pass, work on your quick off the dribble, call it like a fire pass where, you know, John Stockton was great at it, just right off the dribble, just firing it in. And then, um, you know, from there you go into your shooting and then whatever it is that you really need to work on. That's the big thing to me in the NBA. It's like, all right, we've been really poor at high pick and roll. And then second pick and roll defense, that's going to be how we're going to orchestrate uh, the live portion of practice. Or it could be that we need to work on our catch and shoot defense. We had just played J.J. Redick. He was getting too much separation. Hey, we need to clean that up. Or And then after that, you do that segment, you may scrimmage for a little bit. And then after that, you're probably going to have your, you know, your free throws and cool down. And then any guys that want to do any extra work after, whether it's video you know, maybe reviewing sets, uh, just whatever's needed at that point, and depending on what part of the season it's in. Yeah, that's great. And uh, real, real in-depth insights there. So thank you, Coach, for sharing that. And uh, Yeah, look. I, I think the big thing with practice, Chris, is yeah. I just think you guys need to be efficient, right? We don't have to be there forever. Let's get good, efficient work. I'd love it to be more, you know, five-on-five five versus – dry run you know sometimes there's a time and place for both of them but i just feel like the experience of 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 the physicality and it being five on five is big for me especially in the nba because the lack of time you have for practice i want to put these guys in these situations so when they get out there in the game they've already seen it before well and again that's your challenge because of the the schedule i mean you just don't have those times to be able to do it as much as you would want. I think, I think that probably applies to all coaches in the NBA, but certainly someone who's trying to get their defense in line with, uh, with, with the philosophy and certainly in terms of specific opponent prep. So coach, we talked about basically these, these different types of coverages and different things like that. How much different is it in the playoffs? How much does everything that you do evolve and intensify because you have more prep? from day to day for one team and one opponent. That singular focus changed things a lot? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I, Chris, just being in the playoffs 12 out of my 16 years and going to five finals and being fortunate to win two championships, there is a different, it's a totally different level. Uh, and you hate to say it, like as a coach, you expect every day to be like at that 100% high intense level. But these guys know that it's a long season and they're great at like, you know, pacing themselves and but come playoff time, like I always feel like this, like you really have to be on it. Like, like if you're not clean and you're constantly making mistakes, you're not going to play and you're not going to win, you know, and that's where I've been fortunate to be around the, some of the greatest to ever play from, you know, the Paul Pierce's, Kevin Garnett's and Ray Allen's Rondo's in Boston to the, Kyrie's and LeBron's here in Cleveland and then 
what usually happens is those great players elevate their game and then these others just fall in line. And those other players have to really be, you know, high IQ and know and stick to the game plan as much as possible. Like you usually see what happens in the playoffs is rotations get shorter and shorter, right? Because like, it's just, it's just too much at stake. Like every possession matters. Like during the regular season, people may experiment and let a guy maybe run for a little bit longer than, than they probably should have. But in the playoffs, you can see everybody staying in tight. You know, you calculate when you're going to give them rest and then you just let those guys go out there and, and, and perform at a high, high level. But the intensity, the crowds, obviously the media, I mean, it's, it's just a whole nother, nother level. And it's like, it's so hard to explain, but you just know it's there. And it's more fun, I imagine. As a coach, do you uh, no feel question. like you're making more of an impact on the game as well? Well, I, I mean, I don't necessarily I, – listen, at the NBA level, it's always about the players. Like, Of course. Our job is to try to make their jobs as easy as possible. Um, yeah, they're all fun. I love just going to the gym just for practice, you know. But those games are – you know, I think that's where your poise as a coach really comes through. And you have to make sure that, you know, you don't panic. You don't overreact. You really have that, that great poise factor that, you know, separates you. When, and be ready to make adjustments if need be. Hey coach, just a quick interruption from the podcast. I just wanted to let you know, I would love for you to join basketballimmersion.com, of course, to help support all the online sharing I do. But I don't want to interrupt these podcasts for ads anymore. From now on, ads for Basketball Immersion events and products will be at the end of the podcast. I hope you will check them out. For instance, this week I'm sharing information about our BI Training Academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th. Go to www.basketballimmersion.com BI training to learn more or listen at the end of this podcast for more information. Now let's get back to the podcast. Coach, again, so many places we can go, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, having spent such a long time in the NBA and the changes in the NBA game since you won a championship in Boston are significant. But what are your takeaways about some of the things? Because you already mentioned 2-3 zone on inbound Mm -hmm. as something maybe, hey, maybe we're not thinking about this. Like what's old is new again or whatever it may be. But what are some things that you think from that time to now might come back and be of use to coaches and that we should be thinking about ahead of it? That's a great question, Chris. I think one thing, um, you know, it's just, it's how comfortable you are you with your own skin of coaching, right? Like, are you a risk taker? Um, and if you are, then maybe you're somebody who's going to try to possibly play, start a possession in zone and then go to man, you know, um, or are you more conservative and just stick to your guns and, Hey, this is what we do. We're going to do it harder. We're going to do it better. Um, but I just still always think it it does come down to players. Like the teams that usually have the best players are going to win. But I think what people don't understand is that the fit and how it all comes together. Like, like that's what's critical. We had the great fit around LeBron and Kyrie, whether it's J.R. Smith, who was two-way player, great shooter, Tristan Thompson, dynamic roller, great offensive rebounder, right? And then off the bench, whether it's like uh, – uh, uh, Iman Shumpert or, uh, or Matthew Della Dover coming in and just doing, giving you two minutes of solid basketball, right? And then you saw that with Toronto. Like they really, everybody saddled up on Kawhi's back. He was their guy. But then off the bench, the Fred Van Fleets of the world come in and do their part, right? Kyle Lowry has a great uh, final game. And then, you know, it just all building a team together around those great players. Like, I think it's very difficult. Maybe the Pistons were the one exception to the rule, right? There's always exceptions to the rule. But even that Piston team that won with Chauncey Billups and Rip Hamilton and Ben Wallace and Rasheed Wallace, you know, Tayshawn Prince, like those guys were probably not the best at their position, but they were probably in the top, you know, five to six at the time, you know. So 
I just feel like the fit of your team, talent, the great players are going to take you to that next level. Um, but how you assemble and put everybody together around them is, is critical for success. And I guess one, one thought I had is like pickup points of the ball. How, how come in the NBA yeah, yeah. you were not picking up the ball a little bit earlier on dead balls? Like I understand transition yeah. we're getting back is, is that just again, like workload management, you know, because again, you see it more in FIBA game in Europe, especially that they're trying to disrupt or dizzy the ball as it comes up so that you can't just flow right into your play, but it doesn't seem to happen. Well, as it's much. Just, yeah. I, I think Chris, you know, like you got to remember like that game is shorter and they For don't sure. play as many games, you know? So I think that's, that's really a big factor. Like, you know, like if you even look at these, these foreign guys that come to the NBA and are successful, like they don't really average, you know, like 25 points. Like if you, if you get double figures in, in, in FIBA basketball, because it's only a 40 minute game, like that's a big deal, you know? Like, so I think anything from pickup points, like I just think guys in the NBA probably, you know, are either one, not comfortable and, and, and intimidated that they're going to get beat off the dribble. Or the ones that do do it. I remember, when I, I'll never forget, in Boston, I got a great story. We're playing Portland, and, and we're beating them, you know, pretty good. But they had Patty Mills on their team, and he, and they subbed him in. And it was late in the game, and he sprinted to the table. Then he sprinted on the court, and he picked up full court. And i never forget Kevin Garnett saying, get me a Patty Mills. That's the kind of player I want who's going to sprint into the game, pick up full court, make people's lives miserable. So if, if you're, that's your DNA, then, yeah, you need to do that uh, more. But I just think some of these guys maybe, I don't know, they feel like they're going to get beat off the dribble, and maybe that's why they don't do it. I, I don't know. I, I can't give you a, a clear-cut answer on that one. No, it's, it's a great answer, actually. And, 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 again, so much of it comes back to what a player is willing to do at your level as well. And, uh, you know, and rightly so, you have to sell them on the value not just for the team, but for them individually as a player too. As you said, it relates back to them getting more in more minutes and helping their career. And uh, no, it's, it's a great answer. And I guess it's always been a curiosity, some of these different things that might bring value in m moments, but maybe over the long haul, obviously hurt your relationships. Fascinating stuff. Because I don't think coaches think that way enough. Like, oh, it's just, oh, make the player do what's best. Well, it's not that easy all the time. Even at my level, it's not that easy all the time. You have mm -hmm. to sell them on it. Yeah, absolutely. Is there, we got to cover it, coach. I'm almost, uh, I, I can hear Twitter already going off, but closeouts. What are we teaching? What's best practice now for closeouts? What should we be teaching? <laughs> yeah, li listen, this is the hardest part of the game. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt about it. And I, and I would guarantee that, that every, team is working on closeouts particularly in the nba right um i mean my thing is right on the flight of the ball you got to sprint two-thirds of the way the last third you got to break down and then it's all personnel driven right if it's an elite shooter we my I, what i always say is i don't care you're running to make them dribble the basketball right if it's like a guy who can do both those are the hard ones where you know, you know, they could put the ball on the floor and shoot. You just have to make sure you're determined to sprint that last third close uh, breakdown. Just be under control with high hands to defend shot and drive. Right. And then if it's a total non shooter, my thing is like you want to close out short, but don't be disrespectful. Right. Just still close out with a high hand, create a good habit. But but and listen, we could talk and we drill it, but it still is and probably always will be the hardest thing to defend in our game. Well, it, that, that says it. I mean, there's so much that's so hard to defend, especially with the evolution of offense and how skilled these players are. It's just such an unbelievably difficult challenge to be able to get stops. And uh, one coach framed it for me as saying that basically, you know, I don't know what the average was, say it's 111 points. And if you can, if you can find a way to get, you know, shave three points off, then you've got a chance to win games. And it's that simple, but that's no still, question. we're still talking a hundred points. So, you know, that's, that's, yeah, I that's think, I think the other, the other thing that's tough is like just the ability of guys 
the straight line drive, right? So obviously, if you have that one player who can create two up to the ball and create that advantage once they get, you know, they get off and they pass, and then if that guy's a shooter, now like that's where you get into danger territory, dangerous territory, you know, because then now they can make threes, or if you run them off, they straight line drive, and then it's advantage basketball, and that's really to me the biggest part of our game. But you have to have that player that can put two on the ball. That's, to me, the biggest difference and why the teams are most successful is they have that person who can generate two on the ball. Great stuff, Coach. Last question out of curiosity. Is it plays? Are we talking about actions or plays when we're talking and scouting report to our players? Are you focused more on the actions and the blend of those actions, or is it we go through the whole play and scout for players? What I like to do is I always want to try to combine, uh, you know, actions as much as possible so that, you know, we can't go over a team's entire playbook. You know, I think you're, you have their attention for about 20 minutes max, especially in the regular season. The playoff is different. Um, so I want to try to combine as many actions as, as possible um, that – they'll understand and most of the time we'll tell them what their action is called and then let them know, you know, that it's our so-and-so. So if we're running high pick and roll and it's fist up for them, but it's, you know, shirt, shirt tug for us, just those little things can help them. Right. Hey, when they're going into fist up, it's our shirt tug. So if we're on the bench pulling our shirt, then you know that a high pick and roll is coming. Um, but now if they're a team that runs some catch and shoot action where, now, like, you, we're going to go into our coverage, whatever it may be. Let's say we're playing on the top side. Well, when we do play on the top side, they may, A, do this, go to the weak side, all right, and come play the over-under game, as we like to call it. One guy that, that's getting played on the top side goes under, and then the, the guard or the small on the other side goes over, you know, just to, you know, go over that concept. And then we may do, okay, we cover uh, the top lock and they go over under and we hit the guy who goes under. Now they throw the ball into the post. Okay. Now this is what they do. They play split game. So in that one segment, we're covering two things. We're covering our catch and shoot defense, and then we can cover our post defense. Are we double teaming? Are we playing straight up? If a guy, if they run an elbow split, are we going to switch? Are we going to loosen up? Are we going to blow it up? So you can get in one play two different actions uh, in terms of saving time and keeping their attention span. That's what I love to do uh, when we're going over shoot around and walk through defense. Love it, Coach. Again, can't thank you enough uh, for taking this time and providing these authentic insights. And uh, I think so many coaches are going to be excited to hear this. And, you know, defense at the NBA level and all levels is just getting so much more complex. So, so much that you've done to stimulate our thinking. Thank you for taking the time. Chris, thanks so much for having me on. Hope some people get some stuff out of it. Um, and I look forward to seeing you uh, during the season. Me as well, coach. Me as well. So uh, have a great season. Thanks for listening to the podcast, Coach. As always, I would love for you, if you're not already, to be a Basketball Immersion member. Go to basketballimmersion.com to learn more, and uh, please join our growing community as we share the game of basketball, especially with a focus on small-sided games, coaching with a games approach to basketball, basketball decision training, and so much more. Videos, master classes that deep dive on subjects, and then a community of coaches that's there to support you and help you as you post your questions and you work in a collaborative way to be able to help each other stimulate your coaching. Also, upcoming dates for Basketball Immersion events, August 12th to 16th, BI Training, Palm Springs, basketballimmersion.com slash BI Training. This is where I can work with your players and help them develop so many of the concepts that lead to better basketball. And then September 7th, BI Academy, Los Angeles, basketballimmersion.com slash clinics. This is our coaching clinic for coaches to be able to immerse themselves in our topics. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information 
and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.